I will explore some of the hottest business and economic topics. Good evening and thank you for joining me on Eye on Business. I'm Ben Kritz and this evening I'd like to talk about the impact of natural disasters on agriculture, which is a perpetual challenge for the Philippines given our unique economy, geology, and climate. So let's get right to it. It's been an exciting six weeks in this country and not in a good way. On Tuesday, December 3rd, Typhoon Tisoy, which was known internationally as Komori, hit the Bicol region and plowed a path through the central part of the country, including the provinces of Albay, Sorsagan, Masbati, and the Mindoro provinces. That was the 20th typhoon to enter the Philippines area of responsibility this year, and the strongest one since Typhoon Anyak dumped a lot of rain in northern Luzon back in October. Then on Christmas Eve, just a couple of weeks after the first typhoon, we had Typhoon Ursula, which took a similar path to 2013's catastrophic Typhoon Yolanda and caused additional damage, including to some places that were still recovering from the first typhoon. And then if that wasn't enough, and by God, don't you think it ought to be? On Sunday, January 12th, the tall volcano, which has been relatively quiet for about 40 years, suddenly blew up. And that was something most of us in Metro Manila weren't aware of until it suddenly started raining sand on Sunday evening. Of course, areas closer to the volcano are in very bad shape, and some places have been completely evacuated. Now, the direct human toll of these three disasters, fortunately, was very low because in in uh, previous years, the government has become much better prepared to, to deal with the disasters. However, one weak spot in disaster management in this country continues to be the economic impact, which uh, Finance Secretary Sonny Dominguez recently estimated cost the country between 1 and 2 percent of its GDP each year. And the majority of those economic losses are in agriculture. According to figures from the National Disaster Risk Reduction and Management Council, Typhoon Tisoy resulted in about 2.1 billion pesos in agricultural damage. There was about another 1.1 billion pesos from Typhoon Ursula, and at last report, although they're still tallying up the figures, uh, the crop losses from the tall volcano are approaching 600 million pesos. Now, joining me today to discuss the implications of natural disasters for agriculture and the economy in general, and the government's approach to helping the sector recover and work towards greater productivity and sustainability, is our Secretary of Agriculture, Dr. William Dar. Dr. Ben. Dar, welcome. Uh, good evening, Ben. <laughs> Thank you for this opportunity. Well, thank you for being, joining me. Um, first, can you can you give us an update on the on the damage from the the recent disasters, particularly the volcano? I know okay. that's still an ongoing thing, but where are we looking that's at? That's true. Uh, so we started uh, monitoring the areas. Uh, of course, this is uh, Batangas and Cavite mostly affected, and. Uh, the other day, the latest figure was almost 600 million pesos agricultural damages. But this morning, after receiving the reports uh, from the field, it has now reached uh, 3 billion pesos. Oh, gosh. We have now factored in the one, no, 6, 000, more than 6,000 cages of tilapia mm -hmm. around Taal Lake. And uh, as Everyone is aware the 40% daily cuts of uh, Taal Lake uh, on tilapia uh, is brought to Metro Manila, supplying 60% right. of the requirements. I see. Um, now, as far as the as far as the fisheries go, are those are those completely are these completely out of action? Um, is Definitely, there anything anything uh, salvageable there? 
maybe initial first days, but even those uh, initial days, you know, with the high uh, sulfur mm -hmm. uh, oxide and many other toxic elements, uh, the Department of Health has already declared uh, it's unfit for human beings. I see. So if, if anybody gets tilapia from from Lake Taal, they should it's not. They should not eat it. I see. Okay, that's that's. I'm not sure that most people are aware of that. I know there's been announcements about it, but um, you know, you still see it in the market. Uh, uh, in in the market today, uh, what we did upon learning about this uh, big incident is to now mobilize uh, nearby provinces. So mm -hmm. we sent out our regional field offices to touch base with tilapia racers in central Luzon and even nearby provinces like uh, Rizal, Laguna. I see. So they are now, uh, these are now the sources mm -hmm. of tilapia in Metro Manila today. Okay, well that's good. Um, now how do the, uh, whenever, whenever we talk about agricultural losses, usually we get the figure for crop losses. Um, that's that's generally what we see in the news reports. But right. but do, do you break it down into other you know into other lives such as um, livestock, um, farm we, infrastructure? We, in in the reporting format, we, we always follow crops, livestock, poultry, fisheries. Mm -hmm. So we even disaggregate crops into high value rice, corn. Yes, that's mm -hmm. how we do it. Okay, so the the total we hear is. Uh, it's a, 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 a an grand total, and it's about three billion right yes, now, just from the volcano. Reaching three billion now. So altogether, since the beginning of December, we're looking at about six billion. Almost, in, yeah, in more than six billion. A little bit over, I see. Um, now, this may be a little bit of a morbid question. Uh, now, I realize that the volcano was a surprise, but uh, dealing with the two typhoons, you have. Of course, we have some warning when those storms are coming. Were the losses there about what you expected? Um, well, let me mention first, Ben, uh, we, we have historical data in terms of uh, natural disasters uh, impact mm -hmm. to agriculture. Last year, 2019, we have a total of 16 billion uh, peso uh, in terms of agricultural damages. I see including flooding, uh, everything about natural disasters. Right. Comparing 2019 data with 2018, 2018 was more, 34 billion. Oh, I see. So uh, I was uh, sort of, yeah, uh, it's really a country uh, mostly visited by typhoons and other natural mm -hmm. disasters, including Nautal Volcano. And uh, that's already uh, must be taken as fact of life. And mm -hmm. uh, we need really to be uh, more resilient than before. I see. Okay, that's great. Um, now, there's been, there's been some news reports. They've already started to forecast higher inflation, uh, specifically from the volcano. Uh, what other economic knock-on effects can we expect from, well, you know, from, uh, from what's this, happened in the last month and a half? For example, this uh, tilapia supply, mm -hmm. while we may have supply from other provinces, uh, maybe the, the consuming public may see higher prices of tilapia as they are transiting mm -hmm. from the various sources. Right. Uh, in terms of uh, rice, we have enough rice inventory in the country today. Uh, vegetables, this is the time where enough vegetables are grown uh, from up north, uh, mm -hmm. Benguet for one. Supplying requirements of Metro Manila, about 80-85%. So, we, we are uh, able to cope up. I see. Um, now, apart from the fish, what what other what what are the other big what are the other big uh, agricultural commodities from Cavite well, and Batangas? In in Cavite and Batangas, you, you have uh, 
you know, the, the vegetation there uh, would include coconut. Mm -hmm. uh, like it is an agroforestry area, so you, you have various uh, fruit trees, kopi cacao, right. uh, then the pineapple and some vegetables. I see. Yeah. Um, because I know I know a lot of our coffee comes from comes from that area. Yes, that, uh, that might coffee be something is to worry one about. badly affected in the area. I see. Okay, uh, let's take a short break. And we're back with Dr. William Darr, the Secretary of Agriculture. Uh, let's talk a little bit about what the Agricultural Credit Policy Council does. Um, how is it organized? What is its purpose? And um, what is its job now, particularly in times of serious okay. calamity? The Agricultural uh, Credit Policy Council have two, three basic mandates. One, to, to look at the uh, policies relating uh, to uh, giving credits to the farming community, fishing community. So uh, it models as well. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, uh, the, the in modeling, so there would be funding uh, coming from government. And I will mention uh, modeling, for example, startup uh, credit facility uh, for uh, the younger generation, those who have not been in business but would be now potential to be encouraged to go to agribusiness. Mm -hmm. Then, the, yeah, it, uh, it also uh, links up uh, with the department with the uh, other lending institutions to be mobilized in terms of their credit requirements of the, of the whole sector. I see. Um, now, what uh, what specifically does the does the uh, ACPC or the Department of Agriculture overall? Um, what what do you what do you do to to help a, okay. a several thousand farmers? I'm sure tens of thousands of farmers that are in bad shape right now. Yeah, let's take the case of the palai prices uh, last quarter. Okay. And uh, what we did uh, with the funding available with ACPC, we allocated uh, 2.3 billion pesos mm -hmm. for a sure aid loan assistance to farmers, rice farmers, tilling one hectare and below, because these are the badly affected uh, farmers during right. this transition period as a result of the rice tarification law. And uh, so that is now uh, being, that have been received, uh, almost 900, no, yeah, 99% have been received mm -hmm. by the rice farmers. And we are hoping that by the end of next week, uh, we can publicly mention that these have been all 100% disbursed. I see. Now, there are many other credit lines the, that are being handled by ACPC. Uh, I can mention during calamities like now Tal Volcano, there is uh, sure aid uh, emergency mm -hmm. loan assistance that we are, have now uh, put in place, uh, tapping in this instance a rural bank uh, of Mount Carmel of Batangas. Mm -hmm. We have released during our visit the other night with the president in Batanga City, 30 million pesos. Mm -hmm. So farmers can access and or fishers can access the 25,000 uh, loan assistance, zero interest mm -hmm. and uh, payable in three years. So this is, this is funded by, by that rural bank? And this, no, this is funded is out this? of the, bud, the budget. Uh, of the ACPC uh -huh. and uh, we uh, have the rural banks they can do it back. Oh, I see. Okay, so you're working through that. That was my that was my next question: is where is the where is the funding coming from, and what is your yeah you know, what is your pool for 
you know, for calamity assistance of yeah, this kind? Uh, in terms of uh, calamity assistance, uh, two sources again. We have a quick response fund mm -hmm. uh, given by the national government uh, yearly, uh, like last year. Our total quick response fund was 1 billion pesos. Mm -hmm. And this year, this have been uh, up to 1.5 billion pesos. And this is budgeted yes, in uh, the GAA at the beginning of true. the year. Okay. And the other source is what I have uh, described mm -hmm. uh, through ACPC uh, funding mechanism, uh, sure aid, uh, loan assistance, zero interest. Mm -hmm. even, even to those uh, farmers uh, raising pigs uh, as a result of the African swine fever. Mm -hmm. Uh, now that that was a that was kind of a low grade calamity that went on for a little while. How, what is the what is the status of that particular well, issue? Comparing with other countries that have been affected by ASF, uh, the incident is very negligible. Mm -hmm. Beca why why would I say negligible? Although the economic impact is huge, in you know the 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 depopulated number in terms of pigs is only more than just one percent of total inventory. I see. So, but the losses in terms of economic activity is huge, one billion peso uh, a month. Mm. So, uh, we have not. Yeah, we we factored that in already in terms of the 2019 figure of say 16 billion. Right. Uh, because from August, September, October, November, we have four to five billion uh, as a result mm -hmm. of the impact of uh, this African spider. Now, it has um, has that been brought under control? Do you think? Uh, you know, it's the the virus itself. Once found in an area, can be easily managed, uh, controlled, and contained. Mm -hmm. The problem lies now is when uh, backyard hog racers and even some extent uh, commercial hog racers, when they observe this disease, they don't report right. to authorities mm -hmm. at the local mm -hmm. level Which initially. Is, well, that's kind of human nature though. They Correct. don't want to lose their livestock. They don't want to lose, lose their livestock. They still yeah. take advantage. Mm -hmm. They hide even so that uh, why not they, they they will now deal with uh, unscrupulous traders who mm -hmm. will butcher and bring it, uh, bring the pork to other areas. That's now how it is spreading to other provinces. Mm -hmm. uh, and is it is it detectable at all, other than you know, other than laboratory testing? No. And, um, well, there, there would be no way I I would go to the market and buy some pork. There would be no way I could tell that there was anything wrong no, with that the, pork. No, that's visible uh, once it reaches. Uh, the market. I oh, mean, oh. Uh, even in a, you know, visibly a pig affected by ASF, oh, right. you, you have visible signs or I visual see. signs that, yes, this is, yeah, then yeah. you go uh, to the, the laboratory. And that, that I would under, I mean, you know, if the hog is sick, you can, you yeah. can tell, but say the hog, they, you know, they butcher a sick hog, uh, and then I go than. to buy some pork at the market. Is there any way that I would there know? Are, there are indications. Oh, yeah. Are, uh, uh, the meat, uh, the, there are uh, red portions of the meat uh, mm -hmm. showing uh, that the, the presence of virus in it. I see. So it's visible also in the in the market. Areas. Okay, not to... Not I've encountered anything <laughs> strange, but I yeah. was curious about that. Um, there, there were instances in some supermarkets that they have seen uh -huh. this with those visual signs. Mm -hmm. So they confiscated uh, uh -huh. this meat. Oh, that's, great. Well, that's, a, that's another problem that we don't really need right now, but unfortunately, that's a, yeah. that, that's a tough one. Um, now let's let's look beyond the calamities a little bit. Um, you know, uh, calamities, as you said, are a way of life. Um, but you know, frankly, ninety percent of the time, you know, we have normal circumstances, and the normal circumstances for agriculture, unfortunately, I'm sure as you well know, are that it's 
considered, although it's a vital part of the economy, it's considered probably the part of the economy that underperforms uh, the worst out of the out of the various sectors. Um, but as we touched on just a few minutes ago, um, the ACPC has recently launched two new credit programs. Um, I think this news came out about a week ago. Yes, and, uh, before the volcano thing. Yeah, yeah, before the volcano. Um, I thought it was a rough year now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, we're off to a good start, but you know, well, things happen. Can you tell us about these these two programs and um, you know what yeah, what, uh, what they in, are aimed the to do? The rationale for those two programs would be the following. You know, the farmers in the country are now aging uh, average of 60 years old. Mm -hmm. And so we, with the condition that even their, their children are no longer uh, interested to go back to farming. Mm -hmm. So we said uh, this is a millennial country, you know, uh, young generation dominate the population today. And you have an aging uh, farm, farmer's population. So what do we need to do? To, to encourage this younger generation to be enticed to go back either to farming or to agribusiness. I've been advocating on that. I've been writing about that uh, all this long before even I became uh, Secretary of Agriculture. So then the, the last five months, uh, we were towing uh, this idea, uh, three components actually. Uh, the first two components have been launched, I mean, have been approved last week through uh -huh. the council, ACPC, because they have the funds uh, regularly, that the additional funds this year that can be now be the source of this uh, loan program. The first loan program is dedicated to uh, those uh, younger generation, aged 18 to 30, Mm -hmm. uh, years old, no experience in farming or agribusiness. However, with the pa passion and interest and with the mentoring that will be there as a component, uh, then we are opening this, this loan program. So a, an individual can get as high as uh, 500,000 pesos, $10,000. Wow. And uh, with a business plan. Mm -hmm. uh, attached to his uh, or her application. And uh, we will tap the universities, uh, both public and yeah, private, to be the mentoring partner of the department. And uh, uh, even now uh, that we are finalizing the guidelines, there are many interested individuals now. Oh, that's great. Let's come back to that after a short break. Mga isyung pinag-uusapan, mga palitang laman ng pahayagan, impormasyong dapat niyong malaman, tatalakayin, pupusisiin, at hihimayin ni Mario Garcia kasama ang kanyang mga panauhin sa harap ng bayan. Face Off! And we're back with uh, Dr. William Dara, the Department of Agriculture. Now, we were before the break, we were talking about the program to encourage younger people to get into agriculture, yes. which I know has been a big has been a big problem. Um, prior to your you know your coming back to the government, um, you you spent many years with Icrasat working working in mainly Africa and India, as I understand it. And, um, you know, what have you, what have you been able to bring back from that experience? Because, uh, yeah, I, I don't know how much you want to boast, but um, you kind of turned that organization around when yeah, you took over. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, I stayed there for 15 years as mm -hmm. the director general of that institute. ICRISAT is equivalent of IRI here. Mm -hmm. So we are sister institute. And there are 15 of these type of centers in the world, so mostly located in developing countries. Now, the experiences I've had with ICRISAT uh, really has now given me much more, uh, you know, knowledge. And uh, these are a good number of uh, programs now I'm wanting to institutionalize here. Right. 
uh, being the uh, Secretary of Agriculture. Again, uh, one is the agribusiness, uh, you know, mm -hmm. as a way forward to unlocking the potential of agriculture in many ways. Right. When yeah. I was in ICRISAT, uh, we started uh, we a so a public-private partnership uh, with uh, the seed companies of India. You know, uh, while being an international center, we we thought it was necessary to partner with them in terms of developing genetics for the dryland agriculture of the world. So mm -hmm. uh, not only India, but Asia and Africa. And we, we succeeded uh, from an original six uh, uh, companies. Now, be, when I left, after 15, almost 15 years of working there, uh, 60 companies uh, have been uh, uh, a part of a consortium, bringing their own funds, bringing their own germplasm. So uh, we have also our set of funds and germplasm. And that have accelerated the uh, development of hybrids uh, in most of the dryland crops that we work on, sorghum, pearl millet, and uh, pigeon pea. Mm -hmm. so, so that's one area. Yeah. Uh, so, so how would you how would you go about doing that here? Obviously, you'd be looking at rice. There you are. Yeah. Uh, I said, uh, as part of the eight paradigms I have introduced today here in the Philippines, industrialization of agriculture is a major paradigm mm -hmm. where the private sector comes in as a, you know, they, they must be given the nurturing environment to invest and not only invest uh, themselves alone in, in a number of agricultural enterprise, but now how can they be partners with small farmers through their associations, cooperatives? Mm -hmm. So I, I am now uh, very uh, passionate in terms of uh, pushing or uh, having this arrangement of big brother, small brother concept. Mm -hmm. in business, agribusiness. What, what do you see as the, as the biggest obstacle to getting the private companies interested in investing in agriculture? You know, uh, prior to the second stint in the department, I've been with Go Negocio here in the Philippines. This is the group of uh, Joey Conception, the presidential advisor on uh, entrepreneurship, right. dealing with the big business uh, so the, the, I, I can sense that there's a, an interest for mm -hmm. the big business to come to now developing agriculture or investing in agriculture. So I, I, I have seen that as a, you know, an indication that yes, we should now put up that in nurturing environment for them to come in. And yes, the, only the last five months we, we are seeing uh, already a good num number of interests for private sector to partner with small farmers through mm -hmm. their associations and cooperatives. I see. Okay. Getting back to the to the uh, ACPC programs, you have the one for the for the younger people. Yes. And the then second, there was another one for the second loan program. Uh, is what we call micro small entrepreneurship loan program mm -hmm. and this is offered to those who have been in farming and in agribusiness but want to scale up their businesses or their activities I see. so scaling up of farming and agribusiness uh, an individual or a group uh, can also borrow up until uh, 15 million pesos mm -hmm. this time around. So it's a bigger pie. Right. And uh, zero interest, Ben, and uh, payable in three years. So uh, again, uh, it, it's really trying to have that, that supportive environment mm -hmm. to, to been, for them to nurture their businesses, agribusinesses up. Now, now, one thing one thing I read, um, you know, when I was reading up on on these programs, is I was I, I found it a little bit remarkable the extent of the the linkages you have with banks and co-ops and other you know 
funding institutions to you know to manage this. Um, how are you able to do that yes. um, instead of having everything go through land bank like you know it, it used to be in the past? No, yeah, land bank is still a major part. Right, of course, the, they are uh, with the DBP, the equivalent of uh, land bank in terms of you know these two are deeply involved in agriculture, mm -hmm. agri industrialization. So they will continue to be a strong partner and. Also, the micro lending institutions are being tapped in many ways because they, they have the manpower in the countryside. Mm -hmm. And credit is uh, one very important uh, strategy uh, to really uh, unlock, the, again, the potential of the sector. I, I, had, uh, I had Bruce Tolentino from the Monetary Board Yes. on last week and of course agriculture is a key interest to his and we were talking about the changes that have been proposed to the to the uh agri agra law um yes to yes. loosen I, I, do, I, do you, did you have any input we, into we that? are a part of that group the economic development cluster I see. Good. like uh, headed by the department of finance uh, with monetary board uh, neda yes we have been a part and that's one good, uh, important law once amended, again, to support this direction of uh, rural industrialization in this country. Mm -hmm. Because uh, what I have been briefed was the penalties, for example, uh, for banks not being able to uh, lend uh, to agriculture, to agribusiness. So it's collected, uh, and I understand it's sizable by now. Well, it, well, it is now because it's been a pattern for yes. se for several years Correct. where the where the penalty is much less of a cost than the risk of lending to, to agriculture. So both we are tackling uh, that risk. Uh, we should be able to say uh, while risk is there, it can be minimized, mm -hmm. and uh, those who really are risk averse, then they pay the penalty. And this will be collected uh, through the amendment of this law. There will be a fund to support, again, uh, a, a nurturing environment for uh, agribusiness and farming. And so uh, human capital uh, will be nurtured. Even higher educational institutions will be uh, advocated in terms of uh, developing the right uh, expertise needed by uh, farming and agribusiness. So, so basically the idea is if the bank doesn't want to lend to the sector, they're going to pay to support it one way or the yes, other. Yes, yes, yes. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that after another quick break. Hi everyone, I am Zihar Basho and welcome to the new Clark City where the 30th Southeast Asian Games will be held this November. Dito gaganapin ang tagisa ng mga atleta mula sa iba't ibang bansa ng Southeast Asian region. Now, just uh, uh, just have one one quick question, and then I want to move on to another topic. Um, how much funding is is coming out of these these two latest programs from the ACPC? Yeah, uh, so the two programs will have one billion peso each. Okay. So two billion is now two, ready. Two billion altogether. And I was mentioning a third part of a you know uh, strategy to encourage the younger generation. We would like also to learn uh, from the experience of uh, IT sector, mm -hmm. like the Silicon Valley experience. 
where startups are have been funded early in the game. Right. So we will have a funding, almost half a billion initially, to support uh, much more the younger generation have ideas and uh, can be translated into uh, actual uh, products that can support, uh, again, agriculture and agribusiness. I see. Oh, that's good. Now, one of your, you you've, you've have a very strong advocacy for agricultural industrialization, which necessarily um, kind of comprises less small farmers, you know, more cooperative working and, and yes. people scaling up, um, which, which it seems to me kind of goes against the grain of the culture a little bit. Uh, how how is how how is your ideas being accepted by? I mean, it, you know, it's it, it's the sort of situation where the small farmer is given almost a heroic kind of you know okay. kind of impression, you know, and and the, we have the land reform program which breaks mm -hmm. up and gives to individual farmers, yeah, yeah. and here you are with a very sound idea that you you know if you want to make this work you need to come together but yes. that's sort of working in the opposite direction so well, how how is that coming out that's one justification why we need to elevate and have a new way of or a new development framework i would say so mm -hmm. because the, the very studies have already indicated that the parceling out of lands have not been as very significant factor in terms of building up the contribution of the sector to the economy. Right. Well, that's obvious. Yes. And so w there are uh, cases where uh, bringing or to have economies of scale would be the way forward. Mm -hmm. And uh, I can cite a, a good number of this. Uh, and uh, before before that, I can say the, the, what are the components of this. Uh, way forward. One, uh, we, we while transforming the subsistence farmers into self-sufficiency and towards uh, market-oriented economy, uh, there should be this uh, program also for those groups that are now ready for this market-oriented economy. Mm -hmm. So it's a twin approach as well. Uh, having said that, uh, we now have to look at farm consolidation arrangements. So there are existing uh, consolidation arrangements like contract arrangement, contract growing, uh, poultry mm -hmm. uh, and many others. Mm -hmm. But hoping that this time around uh, we will nurture that environment where inclusivity must be there. Inclusivity, meaning why not work now with the Farmers Association? So mm -hmm. there, there will be that supporting uh, mechanism to make it possible that inclusive agribusiness can happen this time around. So it's a win-win proposition. Mm -hmm. So big business plus the small farmers, if they're uh, part of the contract arrangement, well, they should be given the better arrangements this time around. I see. Okay. So that's one. There are many others, block farming, cluster farming. In the sugar land today, they're now starting a 50 hectare block farm. Well, I know that in the sugar industry in particular, that they're not as enthusiastic about land reform as, <laughs> it, you know, as they say, like rice farmers are, because sugar is really a crop that needs scale. Yeah, but know, to, the, to there, there are also, a sm meaning the small scale Sugar producers dominate right. the landscape. Yeah, uh, so that's why we them. need now to mm -hmm. go back to this uh, black farming as well. So th there are instances that we can now highlight and be serving as the models for a uh, agribusiness to grow. So again, enticing the private sector to come forward and partner together with associations. So we are saying associations or cooperatives will always be necessary to collectivize really and have leverage of these farmers uh, now partnering with big business. Mm -hmm. so, uh, those are the uh, 
nitty gritty the, mechan the mechanisms with which we, we will continue now to elevate our uh, investments in terms of building up the capacities of these institutions, farmers' institutions. I see. Now we have just a couple of minutes left, but one thing that the uh, that the recent calamities, uh, the volcano being an exception to it, but the the storms, um, we are going to as the years go by, we're going to be in facing an increasingly challenging climate uh, due to what's happening in the world. Um, what is the what is the Department of Agriculture doing to to kind of make Philippine agriculture more sustainable with what we know we can expect in you know the next coming decades yeah when I came in I look at uh, what are the obtaining programs in regard to climate change mm -hmm. and I, I found out uh, a good number of uh, projects but uh, we have now to move to a level where you need to institutionalize this climate uh, change uh, oriented programs uh, towards the development of uh, smart or resilient agriculture. So yes, uh, we, we know pretty well about the, the facts that are already there obtaining in terms of the impacts like hotter temperature, uh, aber uh, weather uh, aberrations like what is happening today. So. Uh, we, we are now gearing up to that level of uh, you know, uh, having to have adaptation uh, programs or, or mechanisms, including mitigation uh, to a good number of degree. Like, for example, uh, we, we have to uh, follow now agroforestry, you know, uh, in, in trying to again rebuild the upland areas right where agriculture is also uh, being practiced so upland agriculture with uh, agroforestry and soil and water conservation practices would not be necessary to both mitigate and adapt to this changing climate mm -hmm. so many other projects i see okay any uh, any final thoughts uh, any message that you would like to convey to to the public about what you're doing yeah uh, again uh, let me emphasize Ben that uh, there is a new development framework uh, with which we are now uh, trying to uh, develop and grow uh, Philippine agriculture agribusiness is uh, a way forward we now have to bring in the private sector more uh, partnering with small farmers and small fishers. We need to uh, see to it that the increasing budget will be there coming from government with investments coming from the private sector, including that of financial institutions, uh, donor agencies. So this is a new environment under the leadership of uh, President Rodrigo Roa Duterte, who has uh, always uh, his heart uh, for the uh, mass of the people, and these are the farmers and the fishers. So uh, we believe that uh, there is potential to unlocking the, poten the, the growth of uh, the sector so that it can be uh, a much, much stronger uh, uh, contributory sector to the economy. I see. So big challenges and a lot of work still remains. Yes, very much so. Well, that's all for now, and I'd like to thank my guest, Dr. William Dar, the Secretary of Agriculture, for joining me today, and thank you, uh, thank you for coming on, and I wish you all the success in your work. Um, I'm Ben Kritz, and this has been Eye on Business. <laughs>